In the wake of the European arrival and occupation of most of Sub-Saharan Africa, no issue to my mind is more incendiary than that surrounding the ownership of land and the alleged theft thereof by European settlers. Africans insist that all the lands once occupied by the colonists are theirs by birthright and the vesting of propriety rights in the hands of foreigners was unlawful in the first instance. And so a massive theft was in fact committed. In a brazen, what I think a brazen display of outrageous hypocrisy, most of the world has endorsed this view. And that includes the governments of countries like the United States, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. And I, as a displaced white African, ask, surely if land should be returned to the people present at the time of the occupation, then the same should apply to these countries. But of course, that is completely out of the question. What also should be borne in mind when addressing this issue is the fact that throughout history, ownership of land has routinely passed through conquest and occupation. But this has been ignored in the case of Africa. What is also conveniently ignored is the fact that the people present on the continent prior to the arrival of the Europeans are not homogenous and war between tribes of different ethnicities was endemic prior to colonization. Mike was right and chiefdoms were constantly shifting their areas of control. As a result, the Bushmen or sand people were displaced throughout much of Southern Africa by the numerically and physically stronger, stronger Bantu and marginalized. They have subsequently had to find refuge in the arid reaches of the Kalahari. Unfortunately, as a result of this fractious history, the mismanagement of land tenure has had a profound impact on the economies of most African countries. And nowhere in recent history has the importance of property rights been better illustrated than in Zimbabwe, where in 2000, then President Robert Mugabe, using the above mentioned rationales, ordered the eviction of over 4,000 white farmers and effectively collapsed the economy. So with this in mind, I want to refer us to Mr. William Keyes, a former BSAP police inspector, attorney and historian, who now lives in Brisbane, Australia. Will has thoroughly researched this history of the country with particular attention to the question of land, the occupation, the ownership, and he is going to talk us through the actual events as they unfolded and follow that with his analysis of the legal situation as it pertained at the time of occupation and as it pertains now. So with all that in mind, I want to welcome Will Keyes. Um, we've never actually met, but I feel like uh, I've known Will all my life. We've had uh, lots of discussions. We share many common interests. And like me, Will is um, something probably best described as an amateur historian. And uh, he's read extensively on African history and uh, particularly Rhodesian Zimbabwean history. Um, that added to his uh, very high level of legal expertise uh, makes him specially qualified to talk about um, the history of the land issue in, in Zimbabwe, uh, right from the beginning of the occupation up to the present day. So um, uh, welcome, Will, uh, thanks for your time. Thanks very much, Hannes. Well, uh, let's just crack off uh, with a brief summary of the actual events on the ground. Uh, following the, um, the arrival of uh, the Pioneer Column in what is uh, what was then, well, what is now known as Zimbabwe. I wonder if you could just take yeah. us through 
a brief summary of events, and then we'll, we'll move on to the legal implications. Okay. Um, what happened was that uh, uh, after the, um, the occupation, I suppose you could call the occupation of South Africa, um, and the British are taking control in South Africa, you had um, the Prime Minister in the Cape, Cecil John Rhodes, and um, as you know, he became one of the richest men in the world. Now, it was a convention and, and, um, that the British had, which they sort of, well, they've always had it, where they would exploit overseas countries and they would use often royal charters in order to give themselves that authority to do so. So what they planned to do is that they thought that in, in Central Africa, there would be, you know, untold wealth would be discovered. Primarily, they thought in gold. So the idea was to form a, a company, much as we had the East India Company or the, or the, or the various companies in, that they had in America, with a royal charter which gives them authority to be there. And then that company would exploit the resources and for the shareholders. And the shareholders were some of the... Um, the most um, uh, um, highest ranking aristocrats in England. So the British South Africa Company was formed and it got a, a royal charter from Queen Victoria. And that was the, was the real assets of, of the company. It had, a, it had a charter to go up and to take possession of properties in Central Africa, wherever that, those properties were, in the name of the Queen and to occupy those, those properties in the name of the Queen um, and that proc proclamation gave them the authority over to, to, to do whatever they, they needed to do to, to take possession and then to secure the assets in those countries, mineral assets and other assets. But as I said, by and large, they were talking about mineral assets. So they took off and went and had the pioneer column and with that great assets. And as I said, um, the shareholders were some of the, 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 the most highest ranking aristocrats in England. And as a matter of interest, um, Winston Churchill himself was a shareholder in there. And so they go up and uh, they form the Pioneer Column and they have a military division of it and they have a, a, a civil section of it. It just so happens that my grandfather was in the, um, in the civil section, he was an Australian. So they go up to Rhodesia and they um, occupy the Mashada land and in the name of the Queen, in terms of that proclamation, they um, take control slowly. They negotiate with the Matabini. There's all sorts of um, negotiations with regard to concessions, with the Rudd concession and other concessions. And, but nevertheless, um, they were phenotypical of their time. In other words, they, were, they weren't men of our age. They didn't worry about the niceties of today. They had the, the, the Queen's authority, and that's all they needed. They were the mighty British. And um, slowly they took control, and before you knew it, they um, they had the the, the 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 black tribes under control, primarily the Matabili in in Bulawayo, by various mechanisms. We can go into the historical aspect if we want to, talking about the various agreements they had with Logan Gula and how it was all broken. But nevertheless, they ended up in pound seats. So. Um, it became an uneasy thing for them because they didn't find the mineral wealth that they expected to find. They thought they were going to find this, this massive amount of gold they expected to, and it didn't come about. And, and, and as it turned out, they realized that to get their investment back, to, to, to make it, they would have to be selling the land. They would sell the land in Rhodesia, which it, it wasn't initially called Rhodesia, but later became called Rhodesia after Cecil John Rhodes. They thought they, they, they started selling land and they sold that, their land to whoever would buy it. But because they were an English company, of course, um, the British people um, were primarily the people they sold it to. So you'd buy land from the BSA company and you would arrive in, in, in that part of the Shard land and you'd get your land. Now, the structure was that they wouldn't sell all the land. I mean, they were still reasonably sensitive to the fact that they had to look after the, um, the interests of the of the indigenous people. And I say, of course, as I pointed out, the phenotypical the interests were not the interests we would look at things today, how we would look at it. So the, the High Commissioner in South Africa was the British representative that basically looked after um, indigenous African interests in Africa with regard to land. But the land that the, which the company, the real estate company acquired, that was the land that they could sell. 
Well, it got to a point it was it was becoming sort of embarrassing, and and and, and the company no longer wanted, wanted to be responsible for building the in infrastructure of the whole country, country, because you understand the railways and everything was BSA, BSA company property. The courts were BSA property, but actually court, courts of the buildings. The the authority of some of the officers and who they reported to in terms of. Um, uh, of the charter with the Queen it was a different matter, but they were simply window dressing, they were titching their heads. Basically, the company owned everything. And that became um, a bit of an embarrassment. The company didn't want to do this anymore. It was a losing proposition. They kept selling land and selling land, but they kept having to provide infrastructure and there were other problems problems that arose. So they gave the, the local population of Indonesia a choice. You could either join South Africa, become part of the Union of South Africa, or you could uh, become a colony. So what's important for us to remember, Hannes, and it become important when we talk about the legal situation down the track, is that until 1923, Rhodesia was not a colony. It was a self-funded um, 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 entity where the people who came up here and bought their, land, bought their land from the company, from the BSA company, or in the case of, of, of I should imagine, your ancestors and mine, and my grandfathers, they were promised if they worked in the Pioneer Company, they would get 3,000 acres. They wouldn't pay the salary, but they had to do as they were told and obey orders and, and all the rest of it. And they did that. So when they got to Rhodesia, they got their 3,000 acres. But they felt they had now that, that was their, their payment for what they had done. So in effect, they'd been paid. Well, 1923 goes around. They have a referendum to see whether the locals, the settlers, so were called settlers, wanted to stay um, uh, independent themselves. They wouldn't know when they weren't given their choice. They could join the, the Union of South Africa or they could become a, a colony uh, under Britain. And they chose to become a colony. Do you want me to carry on? Am I going ahead too far? Yeah, well, this is where it gets interesting, uh, isn't it, Will? Um, this change in the legality of the basic occupation and now maybe you can... Uh, elaborate on how this impacted on land ownership and really set um, set set the platform for the, uh, the the major issues to come down the line. Yes. Now, Hannes, I want to just say this to you, because you know this also, is that I didn't know a lot of this until you and I became involved in discussing this. And I want to point out is that... Um, it was it always been a bit of a surprise to me after UDI how everything evolved, why everything went south. And we were so busy trying to survive after what happened after Rhodesia. I think you were in the same boat, that we wondered what happened, what was the what was the real legal position? Why were we being thrown out? How, how did this come about? But we never really got down to it. I think you and I in conversation had this conversation some time back. And um uh, we then decided as, an as, as two individuals said, we would look into it. And you sent me a very interesting document called the, the King is Not a Thief, which opened the door for me, quite frankly, to, to investigate it myself. So I'm getting a lot of the information I'm giving today is update information that you and I looked at in, in the endeavor to say, well, let's find out the truth. And, our, and we said, if we find out we've been wrong, we thought we would take on the British government ourselves. And we do it by way of a class action and we discussed the strategy and a lot of people thought we were crazy, but um, we said, no, we'll, we'll have a look at it. And we meant it. Well, in, in, in that investigation, Hannes, we discovered when we looked at the, at the Letters Patent, which was the Letters Patent Constitution that created the colony of Rhodesia. We discovered, I think it was section 60, but I think it was 60, we're in about there, um, that it talked about the actual transfer of the of the land and letters patent basically means the transfer of property it was called the letters patent constitution and in return um you you've got to be paid value so here you had land which was owned by the british south africa company said they were the owners of the land and they were going to sell that land that they owned to the british government the british government would pay them for the land and the uh, and then the, the, the um, British the British BSA company would be out of the question, excepting for the land rights, excepting for the mineral rights. They reserved the mineral rights to themselves, the BSA company. Well, let me but just, the land... you just correct you that it was the British government insisted on being paid for the land. 
It wasn't the other way around. Yes. The, the British government it. said the company well, no, had to I'm, buy I'm, the land back, basically. So to, to acquire those rights, yes, no. the British government needed to be paid. Now, that's true. But before that, even before that, the, the, the BSA company had to be paid. They were interested in the transfer. Okay. So they agreed that it was an agreement the British government would pay the BSA company. So they, they were out of pocket. But the, but the British government then said, no, but the, the settlers must now buy the land again from them. So from the point of view of the settlers, they were paying for the land twice. If you see what I'm getting at, mm -hmm. because the British government right, yeah. So they said, we will only grant you, you, you this, this, you only become citizen, I mean, um, Collins, colony under us, if you accept that you buy the land from us. They didn't want to be out of pocket. So the settlers didn't want to do it because they felt they'd been paying twice. But wiser brains um, prevailed and uh, they had done so well that they said, okay, we'll do it. So the price was two million pounds. So they had to pay two million pounds for the land that they occupied and they would get full title for the land. Everything would be great. They would get self-government also. Uh, Self-government, uh, nearly in every respect, excepting for a few um, a few things in terms of you know um, a few war powers and a few other things which were on the map. But generally speaking, they were they would be, they'd be a self-governing colony, and there was just no objection to that. So the British government had said that five percent interest. You had to pay the money, the two million pounds, by a date certain. They paid the money by a date certain, and um, then thereafter. The British government, the BSA company no longer owned the assets of the country. That was now owned by the Indonesian settlers. But the British government said, no, we're the colony. So they put in their own head, the, the governor general. And um, so now we had our own parliament. So now we were self-governing. And I think just um, emphasize the fact that in return for that consideration, the British government guaranteed those property rights in perpetuity. Well, um, they did, and it is axiomatic that they would do such a thing. If I sell you a house and, and tell you the title to that house, um, it's axiomatic that uh, you know you, you guarantee the, my right to that house. So um, we have to further add there that it wasn't the whole of Rhodesia. Remember, this was, it was all the unalienated land. The, the British government had set aside land for blacks, which is roughly, say, 50% of the country, which, which would be which would remain under the High Commission in South Africa. And so the blacks were being protected in, te, in, in terms of the fact that they had half the country set aside for them. Remember, these weren't um, sophisticated uh, blacks that you, you know today. These were still agrarian um, people. And um, so... At 50% of the land mass was under the British High Commissioner. And that's where you had you had the, 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 the district commissioners and all that sort of thing. And in the very early days, they were reporting to the High Commissioner in South Africa. It was the other lands which had not it had yet had not been allocated yet. It was called, called unalienated. So the settlers then acquired all that land also, the unalienated land. So that's where they paid the two million pounds. So now they had paid effectively twice, but paid for it, settled. Shall I move on? Yeah, so Shall carry on. I, I, mean, I, think, I think we can now okay. pass forward. So the, so the country develops and it develops in grand style. It, it, now we start discovering minerals. Now we start discovering all sorts of wealth, but the, we also we take advantage of the agriculture. It becomes the bread bowl of Central Africa. It becomes one of the, the jewels of, of, of the British um, an example of a British colony in, 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 in the Commonwealth. And you have English people coming over, buying land, feeling that uh, this land is entirely secure because it's been purchased for twice. And in any legal way of thinking of things, there's no way out of it. It's not as if um, this was an original British colony, which uh, the, the people got it for nothing. This land had been paid for and could be, it could be proved to have been paid for. So we get time changes and, 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 and 40 years later, we're getting up close to the 1960s and it's not the same world. You have the winds of change blowing through Africa. You have the pressures from, pressures from America, particularly from the African-Americans that, uh, you know, they were strange ideas about the relatives in Africa. They claim to be African-Americans. It becomes a meme that sets, its, sets itself in, in America. 
and um, for no other reason than they were black, they feel this great affinity and this great knowledge to be able to prescribe to the British what should happen in Africa. The British feel that tremendous pressure, and you have the winds of change under Harold and, um, and Macmillan, and it blows through Africa, and it starts up in North Africa, and one after one, those black African countries go, you get handed over, and you end up with dictatorships and the horrifying stories that come down to us in Rhodesia. So we don't know this. It's unaware of, the reason people are so contented and so happy to be British and they've made such a wonderful contribution to the British Empire in wars and in putting up military bases and doing everything we did. We were just so contented. And we had a, a responsibility towards the blacks and we understood we were building wonderful schools and, and those of us that, that, um, that were not um, insane realized that Ultimately, the blacks would get to a point of evolution where they would eventually, um, through a, 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 a qualified franchise, we thought we would get a qualified franchise where you, to get a vote, you'd have to own property or land or something. And, um, but eventually, blacks would take over. There was no question that was the case. But that was not going to be satisfactory to, to other people throughout the world. And so the British behind our backs in London started to look at this question. And they realized, and this is the important point, and I said, I think you know this, they, they realized that they had to undo that 1923 Let Us Pay Constitution. Undo it, have another constitution which totally ignored our rights in the whole matter, white rights in the matter, and have it ratified by us. So we would be the, we would be the architects of our own doom. And lo and behold, Hannah, that's what they did. In 1960, you see the, all, the, all the debates here that they had in, 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 in London, and they debated it. But we were oblivious to it. We were, we were English. We were British. We just didn't pay attention. We didn't we weren't carefully enough. We, we were too concerned with what happened in North Africa and the, the refugees coming down from the Congo. And we didn't think it would ever happen to us. We were as... We were as complacent as we are today in this world. And we let it all happen. And before we knew it, the British government arrived on the scene with a 1961 constitution, which they had approved in, 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 in the House of Commons. They had repealed the previous 1923 Letters Patent Constitution, where all the rights that you and I relied upon for buying our relatives, our grandparents relied upon for buying was just ignored, destroyed, abrogated, and, and, and obliterated. And then they had, we had the Federation of Rhodesia and they were, they were dissolving that federation. And in the dissolution of that federation, they then had this referendum. Well, the average Rhodesian white didn't have a clue. He didn't know what was going on. I mean, this was language that uh, I find, I found hard to get my head around myself and, and I'm a lawyer in, in later in life. I, it wasn't easy for me to realize what had happened. And, but in 1960, in 1961, they had this, uh, they had this referendum, Black Republic Federation, I think it was 61. And we, they put it to us, you know, break up the Federation and, 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 and adopt the new 1961 constitution. I don't think the average white religion, he didn't even read it, didn't know, but he was trusting. And we had Sir Edgar Whitehead, who was our prime minister. And he was a, he was a particular, type of a perfidious Albion individual, a, a man doing what the British told him to do behind our backs. We didn't know what was going on, we were idiots. Anyway, we were idiots. So we, we agreed to it and by a huge majority, we, we approved that, that, that referendum. We approved our own destruction. We didn't know what we were doing. It was only then after that, that it became known, and then you ended up with the, um, the, the United Federal Party being taken over by the Dominion Party, and then you end up with the Rhodesian Front, where they said, hey, we can't do this, we, we, we're destroying ourselves. And so you had the challenge to that 61 constitution, and you ended up with um, UDI, because the British wouldn't accept it, and we, we ended up in the situation we're in. I'll end this in terms of the legal case. The legal case was, was clear. You and I had been sought and we took it. We, we got legal advice from, from excellent QCs and the QC we used in, in Australia was Nick Ferret, excellent guy. And his advice given to you and I was that um, 
the fact that we had we had approved our own demise by accepting the the the, the constitution through a referendum, and the fact that um, there was the 60, 1960 constitution, and we accepted in the referendum themselves, we had a, we'd abrogated uh, our own rights, and we had destroyed our own rights. Well, I think so um, what's worth just adding is that there was also an understanding on behalf of the Rhodesian politicians that with the 1961 constitution, that would be the basis for independence. And there were assurances forthcoming from um, British politicians, including Rab Butler, who I think was the secretary for Commonwealth Affairs or something at the time, that yes, indeed, uh, we would get independence on the, on the basis of that constitution. And that was an assurance that was later reneged upon. And that was the, one of the triggers for UDI was um, Ian Smith's argument that the British had not honored their obligations. And so he felt as the government of the day, the Rhodesians were left with no option, but to, um, to take their future in their own hands. And um, that was the trigger for UDI. Yes, I, I wouldn't argue with any of those. And there are, there are lots of permutations and, and, and different uh, um, um, assurances given by different British politicians and, and leading us, giving us hope in that. But in the end, what it boils down to is that there was the constitution of 1960, which we, 61, which we ratified by, by referendum. And it was that, that um, repealed forever our rights. And we, because we had agreed to it in a referendum. And I don't believe we for a second understood what we were doing. I believe it was a, it was a con job done under the cover of, of uh, the dissolution of the Federation of Religion in Iceland. The rest of it was perfidious Albion making all sorts of underhand promises and that and, and not us clearly and us not clearly understanding what we had done. But the reason that you and I had to pull back from our suit of the British government, we wanted to get that two million pounds back. Remember, we, we claimed we weren't going to be interested in anything else. We weren't going to ask them for anything else. We were going to say, just give us that two million pounds back at five percent interest um, compounded. And what did that what was that and we, yeah, it claimed to quite an impressive figure. Uh, it was 100, and I don't know if somebody would do the actuarial numbers on it, but it was, well, I think it was something like 170, I think something like a million pounds. And we thought, well, that would be something we could, we could use as a foundation for exhibitions. But um, we, we were, when we agreed to that, that, that referendum, when we agreed to accept the constitution, we agreed to destroy our old constitution. So why would we have done that? In your, in, in your wildest dreams, why, why would you do such a thing? It, it was done... And I've, I've never personally, in, in my in, it's ever since I've known what, what happened to us, I, I have felt uh, sort of aggrieved that the British government, um, you know, we, we implicated and we were involved in doing such a thing because the Rhodesians deserve better. Well, um, just your take then, uh, looking back on the land seizures, um, it appears that the, um, the dispossessed farmers have, uh, have really run out of legal options. Uh, there has been talk about compensation, which I quite frankly um, don't believe will happen as much as I'd like it to happen. But um, it looks like uh, this is um, a manifest injustice that um, we're just gonna have to accept as a fait accompli. I think so, Hannes. I, I, it, 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 it hurts me. Actually, it hurts you. I know that. It hurts us as exhibitions. It hurts us all editions to think we were treated like this when we, we were very good um, um, and loyal members of the, of the Commonwealth and of being British. But I think, uh, you know, I've got relatives on farms in Rhodesia today who, you know, who dearly, I mean, they still live in Rhodesia, relatives there elderly people on the front, but they've lost them and they're not getting them back. Well, one last uh, not getting them question, back. and it's a, it's a vexed one, but a lot of people like to ask it, and I never, well, I've got my own views, but um, 
Do you think UDI was a mistake? Do you think um, it should have been handled differently? I know it's always easy to make these calls with uh, the benefit of hindsight, but um, just in closing, your, what's your answer to that question? I don't think there was any choice to UDI after what the British did. I mean, if you, unless you, you, know, you had to go along, they would have, we just would have had black rule a lot sooner. So it's a question of whether you thought that the survival of, of our values for you know, all those years was worth it. Probably was, in my opinion. But if you want to ask me what the mistake we made was, we were, we never learned from the fact that we'd been betrayed by, that, by, by the British like that. We didn't understand that they would betray us again that when we started down that track and, and, and we allowed them um, to, through my own regiment, the British South Africa Police, I'm a member of that regiment, and um, when we allowed them, you know, we weren't careful on how, on the advice we were taking from, from the British in terms of our security force. We made no attempt, and I've spoken to some very, very, I've spoken to the officer commanding the special branch in the CID of Rhodesia before he died and spoke to him personally, he told me. And I've spoken to, I spoke to the Prime Minister of Rhodesia, Ian Smith, about this also before he died. There was no attempt, real attempt, to, to set up a security apparatus in Rhodesia that collected intelligence on a, on a rural basis so that we could win any insurgency. So when it did happen, not only were we behind the eight ball, but we allowed them to get way ahead of us. And it was too late for us to do anything about it. If you ask me what the mistake was, is our mistake was that we didn't learn any lessons. We didn't look at history. I'm as guilty as anybody else. Had we done that, and we had UDI, and had we adopted a, a far more cautious and prudent approach towards our security, and, and, and had not been engaged so much in the question of white rule, but more, let's, let's build a, 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 a multiracial, multiracial country and, and move ahead with that, we, we probably would... Um, probably would have been able to do something better. Well, uh, okay, just one more, one more question. Um, you, were in the, you were in the security services. Uh, your recollections of post-UDI and- No, I wasn't, I wasn't in the security service. I was uniform branch. I was a member in charge at Centenary. And because I was a member in charge at Centenary, I was, I was a, a, a member of that main jock, Jock, jock Hurricane, every night. So to all intents and purposes, I was very much um, aware of exactly what was going on when they set me up there. Um, that's a separate story, as you and I know. Yeah. What I want so, to ask you is, is um, immediately after UDI, it's only actually quite recently that I've tumbled to the, uh, the full extent of the preparations to invade Rhodesia. Um, and I do remember my dad, who was uh, then, I think, a major, in the, in the army reserves. I was only 10 or 11 then, but I remember him saying that um, his job was to go and I think blow up uh, or destroy Grand Reef airfield. Well, the airfields around Amtali, if the invasion was uh, actually took place. Um, but as I say, only recently have I, have I read the details and how much work uh, and preparation went into it. It was a very close run thing. And I'm just wondering um, what you remember from that, that, that immediately post UDI when there was the talk of uh, a military style invasion. Well, at, at UDI, I was, uh, I was actually de training in the BSAP depot as a, as, as a recruit, and we were sent out to the Midlands to, to, to look after a, a, a camp in which Robert Mugabe was in that camp. That's when I first met Robert Mugabe. I was a young policeman, and he was a detainee. But um, I, I, had, I really didn't have any expectation that, uh, that the British would do anything. I think at that stage, we were still... So the Queen's photograph on all our window, all our, uh, our halls, and, and we were still thinking we were very British, and we really believed that, and, and we, we thought we were fighting communism and all sorts of things, but we didn't, we never didn't realize it was just a change of, of furniture in Africa. And, um, but later on, when it, we, we, you know, it went on for a long time, and when it, it was discussed, and they were talking about British troops, I, I wondered whether we would fight them, and I came to the conclusion that we would. We would now, we'd sort of cross the Rubicon, not so much in the police. The BSAP, remember, 
80%, 90% of the BSAP at that, reducing rapidly, but were ex, ex recruited in the UK. Mm-hmm. So we weren't going to, wouldn't, would have got that out of them. But as it got on, as time got on, I, I began to think, no, certainly the, secu- the, the, the security force would fight. And then I heard a great story, which um, the photographs were sent to me later about when Lord Soames and Prince Charles were here, they were flying at where the RLI, you know, dropped their decks and gave them the, the brown eye. And I thought, you know, if ever I had any doubt they'd fight them, they would be fought. It was because when they did that, that's what they were showing as the level of respect well, actually, they were showing. Well, it's, actually, it's, it's funny that you mention that, but um, Ian Smith uh, told, told me personally the story, and so did uh, Ron Reed Daly, um, and I have written about it, but um, at the, during the build-up to UDI, um, Ian Smith was obviously torn. There were uh, people close to him who were arguing it against it, and there were people who were for it. And uh, he was trying to navigate his way through this, but um, he, was also, he was certainly running out of patience with Harold Wilson. But he does say it was a trip to the RLI sergeant's mess, I think, uh, when Ron Reed Daly was the RSM of the RLI. And Ian, he took Ian Smith there for a beer. And he took him into the sergeant's mess at the RLI and introduced the prime minister. And he obviously got on really well with these type of, type of guys. And to a man, they said, we're up for this fight. Um, the sooner we get on with it, the better, but um, let's, let's get busy. And um, Ian Smith said, you know, that, that, uh, that get together was a, was a signal moment in, in a sort of political life because he walked out of there and he, and he spoke to Ron Reed Daly outside the pub and he said, yeah, Ron, I think we're, um, we're ready for this. And uh, basically let's go for it. And it wasn't long after that, that um, he declared UDI and uh, the rest is history, but that's something We'll, uh, yes. we, we can talk about in more detail later. Yes, I, I, when Ian Smith came to Australia, we, we took him to dinner, and myself and my wife Jackie and, and a small group of others, and we spent the entire evening with him. We had a really good talk to him about everything. And he was really open with us, he told us everything. He told us what we, we, what you, what we knew as plan B. We, we asked him about it, and he told us. But I think he made a big mistake when, 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 when we did by not understanding that. Um, it was a question not of military might, but more of intelligence mm. and understand how, yeah, how, you, how you run that sort of a war. Attention wasn't paid to it. The BSAP were brilliant at, at, in what they did across the whole country. But mm. No attention was paid to it. Mm. No attention was paid to it. So my love is for the uniform branch of the BSAP. And I'm, as I speak right now, I'm the real president of uh, the BSAP Regimental Association. Very proud to be. But I'm not going to put my head in the sand and saying that, 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 that we, um, we were served by the special branch. We were not. A big, big weakness was we did not factor correctly that we should get an intelligence operation going in Rhodesia, which was going to be set to none, and it should have been run by Rhodesians. That is a, that is a very um, important point you make, Will, and it's something... Uh... I want to talk to you about in in greater detail at a, at another at another interview. So, we'll, thank you, Anas. Well, thanks thanks for for your time today. But um, I would very much like to come back to discussing the um, the intelligence issues with you when we talk next. So, thank you, Anas. Thanks again. Very well. Thanks, man. Thank you very much.